So if you count uncastable faults, then obviously your coverage is never going to be 100%. Uh, which in software testing is uh, 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 a bigger challenge because in the large software, uh, it is uh, not uncommon to have something like 5% of the uh, code under chip. So you just can't get to it. Whereas in hardware, the number of uh, faults which are untestable are uh, usually small. They, they are off, often there, but uh, they could be less than 1%. So simulation is used to determine coverage. In hardware, you have the fault simulators. In software, you have a test coverage tools where you apply a, a in case of software, I guess you cannot call it simulation. In that case, you actually apply real test, and in uh, uh, in case of hardware, I guess you have to call it simulation because you simulate the real hardware. But of course, when you have software, then you can run the real software. But as uh, so software test coverage tools or hardware for simulation tools, they will tell you about uh, the coverage that can be achieved uh, and hundred percent coverage. Uh, not feasible for uh, complex systems. Now there's a, a procedure which is often used. What they will, what people do is they will um, obtain a test set. And after you get a test set, you can uh, evaluate coverage. By uh, simulation, uh, we're using uh, test coverage tools. And then you ask the question, is that enough? And how do you know how much fault coverage is enough? Uh, that's a question. And if it is enough, then you are done. And, and no, then you generate more tests. fault coverage and keep doing it until your coverage is satisfactory. Now how much coverage do you think uh, would be enough? Let's let's talk about hardware. Um, it depends. Uh, if it is a large circuit, if it's substantial, maybe in some cases if there's a chip, maybe you want to get at least 80% coverage or maybe 95% uh, test coverage. And um, in case of uh, software testing, okay, have you come across the coverage values for software testing? It's very dependent on the type of software that we're using and at what stage we're doing the testing. So when, when, when the approach is like the end, like the software is completely ready and um, it's usually a user requirement, it can be defined by the users who are doing the testing or it can depend on the type of the software, how critical that software is. Right, yes, it, it depends on how much you are willing to pay yes. for the yeah. cost of testing. Yeah, because the cost on So what, what are the typical numbers um, that you have come across? I worked like with a system where 70% was fine. Okay. And there is like so some... So that's 70% of, uh, is it branch coverage or... Uh, it statement? was branch coverage. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's an example. So 70% of branch coverage is considered adequate in some situations. Yes. And, uh, but if you had gone to uh, a less strict uh, coverage measure, yeah. like uh, statement coverage, you could have gotten close to 100%. Yeah, exactly. But uh, high, 
getting 100% branch coverage in software is almost impossible. Uh, at best, people get around, I don't know, 85% or so. Uh, it depends, again, it depends on how much you want to pay. Because as I was sh showing in this chart here, as you get closer and closer to 100% coverage, it becomes harder and harder to get additional fault coverage. Yeah. Because the faults remaining that have not been covered, they are very hard to test. So, uh, incidentally, there is, uh, I was looking at something, and there is a little bit of theory behind it. People have tried, now let us talk about hardware. Hardware yield versus uh, coverage. So people ask this question. We are manufacturing a certain chip, and a fraction of the chips are going to be bad. And um, so the question is, how much testing you should do to uh, make sure that most of the bad chips are removed? And that, has, that is uh, referred to as uh, addressing the yield question. So if you reject more uh, uh, devices, then your yield is less. And uh, now let me cut through the mathematical analysis. You can find that in some papers. So here is test coverage. And here, let me plot uh, percent of uh, bad units identified. And let's make this 100%. So ideally, you want to identify all the bad units, but things are going to be like this. In other words, and then this becomes a, a kind of a sign to it. So what happens is that after a while, it may not make sense to do more testing because that consumes expensive uh, time. And uh, by uh, this time, you have, you have already found a large fraction of the bad devices anyway. So you are going to ship some uh, bad devices, uh, which are going to be returned back probably. Uh, but that is a trade-off. That is the economics of testing. So there's, there, there are some papers on hardware yield versus uh, test coverage. But uh, that's the main idea. Now we will come back to this type of question in software, and actually there is a, an observation which is very different, and but we will talk about it later. Okay, now let us talk about fault distinction. So far, we talked about the fault detection problem. And if we detect a fault, we didn't care which particular fault it was. We just threw the chip away or threw the board away. But let us talk about fault distinction. So in fault distinction, um, now there are a couple of different uh, approaches. Basically, you have a system in which you have a, a defect, and you have a, a defect, and you want to find out where exactly this defect is, or which particular fault it is. And let me illustrate by the problem by an example. Let us assume that we have um, three faults. And let me call the faults F1, F2, and F3. And let me assume we have three tests. And let me call them T1, T2, T3. And um, 
And let us assume that only one fault is present. And one and only one fault is present. Okay, and let us assume uh, things are like this. Here we have uh, the faults, all F1, F2, F3, and test T1, T2, T3. And let us assume that T1 tests for F1, and tests for F2, and does not test for F3, and T2 does not test for this, but it tests for these. And T3 tests for this, does not test for this, and tests for this. And the problem is, you want to apply some tests and find out which particular fault it is. Now there are two approaches. You could have a preset approach. In the preset uh, approach, you can apply all of them, T1, T2, T3, and look at the outputs. So it is basically uh, going to take, take three clock periods for you to do your uh, test application. Assuming that analysis after that uh, doesn't consume any uh, significant computation time. Now you can have an adaptive approach, which is kind of interesting. Uh, in an adaptive uh, approach, uh, the idea is that <coughs> as you look at the results, you adopt your uh, strategy as you go along. And that is the adaptive approach. So in an in adaptive approach, uh, here, uh, why don't I write here? Now here's one possible uh, approach. You apply T1. Oh, I'm not supposed to write that close to the edge of the board. That's fine. Okay, so, okay, maybe I'll write here. Uh, is that going to give me enough space? Okay, I guess I'm supposed to write big. So, maybe I'll write here. Okay, we apply T1. Okay, so there are two possibilities. T1 will result in uh, detection of the fault or not. So here we have, uh, let us say, no detection. And here we have a detection. Now, if a fault is uh, not detected, you could uh, you apply T one. Yeah, if you, you apply T one, you know that there is a fault, and you did not detect a fault. Then you apply T one. Obviously, fault has to be F three because it's the only fault that will not be detected by T one. So you can stop after applying one test. On the other hand, uh, for uh, if there's a T1 detects a fault, it could be uh, either uh, T2 or T3. So then we apply T2. 